Ja, hallo, guten Abend hier vor Ort und online. Ähm, ich begrüße ganz herzlich zum heutigen Mark Future Lab, einer Keynote und einer Collective Action mit dem Künstler Adrian Misika, der zu diesem Zweck mit dem Zug sehr klimafreundlich aus Berlin angereist ist. Die Keynote wird auf Englisch stattfinden. Ähm, der Künstler ist gerade mit seinen äh, drei Videoarbeiten, eigentlich drei Videodokumentationen von Aktionen bei uns in unserer großen Climate Care Ausstellung im Rahmen der Vienna Biennale vertreten, in dessen Kontext eben auch diese heutige Veranstaltung stattfindet und noch einige weitere, die folgen werden. In der Ausstellung Climate Care – Reimagining Our Shared Planetary Futures geht es darum, Inspirationen, Innovationen, Lösungsansätze und Provokationen zu zeigen von Künstlerinnen, Designerinnen, Architektinnen, Aktivisti Aktivistinnen aus Wissenschaft und Forschung, die uns anregen sollen, über Klimafürsorge und über Pflege unseres Planeten, unsere Beziehung zur Natur ganz grundlegend nachzudenken und auch mit einer mehr als menschlichen Perspektive in dieses Thema reinzugehen. Und so sind eben auch alle anderen Spezies genauso relevant wie wir für das Zusammenleben auf diesem Planeten und auch das sogenannte im österreichischen Unkraut, im englischen Pioneers Plant, ähm, Pflanzen, die dort wachsen, wo wir sie eigentlich nicht haben wollen, um die es unter anderem auch geht und die ein, äh, eine gute Allegorie sind für das, äh, was Adrian jetzt auch erzählen wird über seine Arbeit. Herzlich willkommen. Danke. <coughs> Thank you, Marlies. Um, so I'm going to be speaking English because I'm afraid my German is uh, <coughs> too poor to have this talk in German. Um, so hello, I'm Adrian Misika. Um, as Marlies just introduced me. Um, so I wanted to introduce myself as a, an animal, a human, a father, a husband, a son, a friend, an artist, a gardener, an activist. The list could go on for a while, but already this frames how I use my walk time on this planet that we all share. Um, so I think it's, I, I would like to, to take, I, I, am, I aim to take the posture of the gardener as an artist. Um, a gardener uh, needs to be patient. Some, uh, a, a quality that I, I used to lack and I'm still working on, uh, but that gardening teaches me very well. Um, um, the gardener needs to anticipate, accept failure, and accept life cycles with deaths and diseases eventually. Um, observe and enjoy evolution, slow growth, decay. Take what is coming without exhaust exhausting resources. Look out to the upcom upcoming seasons, look out to the future. Um, and this is, this is how I feel now about uh, working as an artist and um, even living in, in the city. I live in Berlin. Um, I am having, uh, my, my life and my art are very much intertwined. Um, so what I do in my gardens or the gardens that I take care of, not only mine, um, I tend to also apply it to, to the art I produce. Um, so in, in the biennial um, um, that I was invited here at the MAC, I'm presenting um, an ensemble of three works that work as a, now as a trilo trilogy, but might also uh, grow slowly, as uh, the first three iteration took over three years, I, I produced maybe one action per year. Um, they are documentations of, of minimal actions, of very simple, humble things that I did in the urban landscape. Um, the first one started in 2018 during a heat wave in Berlin, where I live. There was a, global heat wave, I think, I assume, but m most of Europe was under a very big um, drought. Um, and so I went down the street where I live on the Karl Marx Allee and I started watering the weeds. Um, weeds is this um, name that in English is used to call those, those plants that are unwanted by human 
Um, so this is a whole topic that I'm starting to address also in, in my work that is very interesting and political. Um, it's how, how we name uh, things and, and how it influences uh, people's uh, understanding of it and behavior. Uh, in most languages, um, weeds have a pejorative connotation a negative uh, connotation. In German, actually, it's quite beautiful, the Unkraut. Um, in French, it's mauvaise herbe, bad herbs, very pejorative. Um, and in, in, in most languages, there is this, uh, foc this negative focus um, that mostly comes from capitalism uh, and our um, intensive uh, agriculture system that comes from second, uh, after Second World War, um, intensification and the, the, the coming of petrochemical uh, fertilizers that came to massive monoculture. Um, so the, the Unkraut is basically, or the weeds are basically undesirable because they are threatening productivity. That's kind of framing why we are fighting against it. Um, and Basically, my focus is here not on the treatment of weeds in agriculture, but on their, um, their development in ur urban landscape, um, which they are also being fought for different reasons. I mean, as we know, when we let vegetation do its things, they, it takes over everything very quickly, and we then forest is coming within a few decades, uh, which I think is a beautiful <laughs> concept. Um, and yet, um, there is little we know, or the masses know about those plants, and little attention um, towards them. So I'm just giving a sort of focus um, to the invisible or the overlooked. Um, and, you know, learning from them, you, you can I mean, a lot of people know, but uh, stinging nettle is a very delicious soup and is, uh, for instance, a, a, very, uh, a very pleasant uh, tea as well. Um, as well as, uh, um, I don't know, Dent Don de Lyon, which is very good salad. And, and so there, there's a lot of uh, those plants. I, I like to call them pioneer plants rather than weeds because they, they are the first uh, settlers. They don't really need soil. They just come from a crack somewhere because there is a tiny bit of uh, water between two cobblestones like here. Um, and after them, they will decay. They will make the premises of soil. Um, if it would happen over a few generations, uh, we would see birches come, come and then after birches, uh, oaks and, and so on, and forest would eventually grow. Um, so I find, I find this all very interesting and fascinating. So, um, so basically this gesture I made in this uh, first action, Unkrautpflege, uh, was this, this very tiny thing of taking care of plants in public space. Public space is the, the other thing. Um, we have a tendency to take care to our beloved ones to our things we that belong to us um, another thing about that that comes from capitalism and the, the whole idea about property we care for our things uh, public space is sometimes neglected some people think it belongs to nobody uh, when I think it belongs to everybody and then um, there is um, there is a possibility of caring for things that are around us and not, not thinking someone else will care for them. Um, so I went down the streets with my watering can and I watered the plants. Um, the next day I thought I could record it and um, I brought a friend who filmed it. So a documentation happened and it became this work, Unkrautpflege, which later on, um, can we maybe switch to my computer? Um, later on became um, an instruction work. I can now just just for a second come back to the, the origin of this um, this action um, towards vegetation in my in my work um, and come back to um, Agape which um, goes back to when I lived in uh, Mexico for a little while. Um, so I was interested in, in um, as I am very often, um, 
stories, um, myth um, stories that circulate through oral knowledge. Um, and while visiting a, a farm that produced mezcal, this uh, very uh, popular drink in Mexico made of, um, of ag agave, these plants you see there, um, I learned from an old farmer that when, so what you see here is an agave flowering. Um, it makes this giant asparagus that was kind of uh, fascinating me. Uh, and I, I learned, and it basically does, it's the flower. It, it does this flower at the end of its life. At the end of its life, it gives all the energy it can to reproduce um, um, and, and uh, make babies. Um, and I learned that when you cut this flower, you can prolong the plant's life another t 10 years. And so I got myself a machete and uh, spotted a flowering agave and uh, made an attempt to save this plant's life because it was an old plant about to die. And by doing so, it's a violent gesture, but it, it was this ambivalence. You know, it's a violent gesture, an intervention in, in, in nature, uh, a, somehow pruning, somehow a gardening gesture, uh, and yet out of scale because you see this, this flower is, is three times my size. Um, I thought this would take a few minutes. Um, and so, I mean, I can play the, the, the video for you. I'm not going to play it all because actually it took me 20 minutes to cut it. Um, so I'm even going to go a little bit further. So, you know, I thought I'm going to make a very short action. It didn't happen the way I thought. I exhausted myself in the heat uh, and I didn't let go. And it ended up being a work of 20 minutes, one shot. Um, re-establishing a certain horizontality in the landscape, a certain femininity in this uh, very masculine landscape. Um, so it was also a work about landscape. Um, and, you know, and then, you know, it's just a decision then that was taken to not cut it, not make it shorter and just show the exhaustion, uh, the clumsiness also, because I'm not, tr I was not trained and prepared for this, for this work. Um, and so, so this was the premises of the work I'm, I'm, I'm showing now. It was not yet in the urban landscape, was not yet about weed, even though the, this, this is Agave Americana, this was another layer of uh, subtlety, you know, it was somehow an attempt to save America from an imminent death. Um, Agave Americana, by the way, is one of the, the agaves that Mezcal is not produced with, so this is uh, the wild one, so to say. Um, so eventually the, the plant is falling, but I'm, I'm, I'm keeping the suspense for another time. <laughs> um, uh, one year later, still in Mexico, actually at the border with America, um, I continued this, um, this intervention series uh, with, in a work that is uh, titled uh, Cactus Agape. Uh, where I spotted this archetype of a, of a cactus, which is the saguaro cactus, which is also a very interesting species that became the, the archetype of the cactus, from Tex Avery to, to, to tacos brands. Besides, it's uh, only existing in this very small region of the world and nowhere else, and so it's not a very common cactus, but it became a, it became a cliche. Um, so I got myself some pillows and uh, went for hugging this very lonely old guy that probably didn't get so much um, love from our species. Um, it was very stingy and <laughs> the pillows were full of spikes. Um, and this one you see is very short. Uh, it is what it is. It's uh, just one single hug. Um, it took me some years before I could take it out of the drawers and, and, and feel like I can, I can put it out in the world. Um, because at this time of my life and uh, my art career, I was not ready to be on this side of the camera. Uh, and this is what changed in the, one of the things that changed in the last um, couple of years. Um, and, for, and, and then came uh, the Unkraut Pflege and the, and the works that I'm showing here in the, in the Bainio, um where I thought it's important 
Yeah, it was just before. <laughs> it was just before, but I thought I'm showing now Cura. Um, so this is the instruction for Cura. Um, take a, bu a bucket, a cloth, and a sprinkler, fill them with water, go out on the street, find dirty plants in public space, cleanse plants with care, leaf by leaf, go on until tired or hungry. Well, it has to end at some point, and we, how we have metabolisms, and we happen to get tired or hungry. So, to say, um, so in Mexico City, where I spent a lot of times, I found um, I found those plants under the urban highways, or they are not really highways; they are just kind of urban gigantic roads um, that are disappearing. They don't even have a sidewalk. They're in the middle of uh, there's cars on the right, cars on the left, cars over them. Um, they don't get rainwater because they're under, they're covered. Um, and someone planted them there. It's not wild plants. They are not weeds. Um, and yet they get very little care and attention and they even disappear because they, they, they are so dusty that they are gray as you can see. And this is just a sprinkler with water. Um, and you see how it goes. Um, this was a very interesting action for me. Also, after I, lo I looked at it um, and analyzed what happens, um, it, 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 is a, it is a painterly, ge a painterly gesture. You know, it's like giving color to to, to plants that are that are non having colors, and yet it's a subtractive gesture when painting is an additive uh, medium. Uh, as, and, and, and so it's like photography. It's uh, um, taking out of the world, framing something, uh, when painting is actually an additive medium when you add to the canvas. Um, and yet what, what happened there is it's just a, it's, it's, it's a spa treatment for another species. Um, I could hear the plants thanking me that they could breathe, that they gained their nice dress again. Um, I didn't want to stop. I mean, I got, eventually got tired and hungry. Um, but, and there were so many of them, and it was really hard to stop. Um, so I, I, I had a lot of uh, pleasure doing this. Um, it's, it's a bit stupid to say, but it's, um, it was very satisfying, uh, as well as the watering in Unkrautpflege. Um, and, and then I, I, I started this action, you know, as a, a solo gesture, let's say, like it's something I do, and then I, re I recorded it, and then I wanted it to become um, um, accessible to everyone or to, gi to give it, and I thought uh, it's, it is um, an activism. It is my, my, my thing as an artist um, uh, to, to share it to everyone, so I made it an instruction work for everyone to appropriate. So I wrote the instructions for it, and anyone can activate this work by going out and cleaning some dirty plants in public space. Um, again, it's something that some of us do at home. Sometimes the plants get dusty, and it's nice to clean them a little bit. Um, and in public space, it's, it's just another level. Um, it's a little bit like cleaning a beach um, and, and getting the plastics out of the nice beach we like to go swim. Um, but for the cities we either live in or that we, we enjoy uh, spending some time. Um, I mean, I would maybe just show just a second the Unkrautpflege um, instructions, which will maybe happen after this um, talk. Um, take a watering can. This actually is very precise. You can take any... <laughs> container that contains water, um, fill it with water, go out on the street, walk down one way, water all thirsty weeds. Thirsty is important because they are not all thirsty. Um, refill water wherever you can, go on until tired or hungry. We keep the, the baseline. Um, so, I mean, I wanted to play maybe the, the video. Um, this, this work started um, also very basically um, where I live, on the Karl Marx Halle in Berlin. Um, and I, you know, it's, it's just about this, you know, you live somewhere, you see it every day, and yet you don't do much with it. Um, 
I, I really love where I live also because of its symbolic, you know, it's like living in uh, ideology, uh, looking at ideology, and that's the Kino International, it's a fantastic building. Um, and what I'm watering right now is a tree that was chopped to leave a view on the Kino International. Um, this is, you know, you can, you can discuss about is it good to remove a tree so that uh, a, a monument will get a monument or a, a nice building will get a better view on it. But as a matter of fact, some weeds were growing wild there. And that's in front of a bank that was getting refurbished. Um, of course, when you know the anecdotes, uh, you know, I get emotionally involved because it's my street. Um, it took me two days to go through the street because it's a very long street. <laughs> Um, and also because of the heat, I got exhausted quite um, quite easily. Uh, so I used all the public infrastructure to help me uh, do. I used the fountains to refill the, the watering can, and it's just as simple as it gets, you know, and entering. It was pre-pandemic, so I could enter a restaurant without a mask or a vaccine passport and, and ask for water. Um, usually they would smile and just give me water. Um, nobody really. Of course, um, it triggers uh, some 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 strange looks in the street. People look at you like you're you're a bit funny, or a bit crazy. Uh, but also some empathy, and, and that's that's also what I'm looking for. And it's like uh, raising a bit empathy and, and curiosity about uh, about these kind of things. Um, I learned a lot of things because I researched the the, the weeds that I was. Uh, either cleaning or watering, and, and discovered uh, quite an uh, impressive uh, biodiversity. Um, so so that's, that's what I can say for now about um, this work. Um, and also the, the trans-species empathy, which I'm having quite a, a, f a focus on um, as a non-anthropocentric uh, focus. Um, I am. The, the, the last iteration of this work is at Pioneer Street, um, which just happened last year. Well, it's dated 2021 because I finished the, 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 the video this year, but it was shot in November 2020, uh, where I used my uh, own compost. So this is another branch of what my, my, my research at the moment is very focused on, on composting. Uh, the whole philosophy around composting, which is uh, absolutely great, and I, I encourage everyone to start uh, compost at ho at home. It's you don't need a backyard or or a garden or uh, even a balcony to to make your own compost and and recycle your food waste into into a fertilizer for plants, basically. Um, so. I produce my compost. Uh, I, I happened to I, br I brought some to Lisbon where I was having an exhibition. Um, I accidentally, I and then I used my compost to to feed some some weeds um, in the street of Lisbon. Um, here you can see a bit of this beautiful matter, um, decomposed, full of nice good bacteria and uh, food for plants. You never need a, a, a extra fertilizer when you use this. It's just all the plants need. Uh, in a way, those plants, they are not really in need of this compost because, as I said, they are pioneer plants and they are satisfied with very little. That's why it's called pioneer street. It's a little bit like a nachtisch, uh, a dessert. You know, it's just kind of <laughs> a chocolate after your coffee. Um, and again, it's just a simple gesture of care. Uh, it's non-spectacular. It is um, still very satisfying, and it's not easy to see any results. You know, like in in gardening, you one needs to come back, and eventually you come back. The plants are gone because some people burnt it with gas. That's what I saw uh, um, down in Berlin, down where I live. They on the cobblestones. They come with. Uh, a burner with gas to, to get rid of the weeds uh, between the cobblestones because they are not uh, allowed, thank God, to, to use chemicals since a long time, but they're still getting rid of them. Um, yet they always regrow, you know, because their roots are underneath and they are, <laughs> they are stronger than this. So every year you see them coming back. Uh, in, in the backyard of uh, my, my studio, where I mean, the, my front door, I, my, my studio happens to be in a, in a second courtyard um, in, in Berlin. Um, there's cobblestones and I'm watering uh, the cobblestones uh, all the time. So in front of my door is a lush garden. 
in between spring and summer, uh, when the rest of the courtyard, which I don't really have access because there's some cars parked or other people who don't really want that I intervene, uh, is getting really dry. So I, I can see a difference and uh, I happen to so throw a few seeds and then I, I saw some wildflowers coming and uh, it's, it's interesting what can happen with a few, a few gestures of, of care. Um, but it's also interesting, and this is when I'm, I'm coming to um, one of my latest works, uh, it's interesting to not do anything and see what happens. Um, I'm, think, I'm thinking, of course, of Lois Weinberger here, that you, of course, here in, uh, in Austria know probably very well, so he's one of my heroes. Um, and I'm, I made sort of a homage piece to him, also in, in Portugal, where I'm working a lot at the moment. Um, so I made this word called Ila de Yervas, which call, uh, is the Portuguese translation for Weeds Island. Um, and what you see on this slide is, um, is, a, is a, a sign that I, I, I didn't paint it myself, but I had a sign painter painting it. <laughs> Um, and the QR code including is a painting, the whole thing. Um, it is a map of a garden. The garden that is uh, hosting this work is the Estufa Fria de Lisboa. It's, the, it's a, a wonderful uh, greenhouse. Um, it's a sort of botanical garden without the scientific purpose of a bot botanical garden, so it's, it's more of a leisure place. Um, it's hosting a lot of uh, tropical plants and also some cacti. It has three sections, a uh, cold and a uh, warm and, uh, and a dry section. Um, so I was invited to, to make a work there. It was normally for three months. Um, and I came up with the, um, this idea um, when, because there was lots of restrictions. You could not touch any plants, of course, not to damage anything, and you could not bring or hang anything. Um, and so I saw this uh, island that you see here in the back, which is already, sorry, I'm sliding a little bit. This island here uh, was transitioning. So there was nothing spectacular planted. And I saw that there was some what uh, I thought were weeds. And uh, after experts uh, came and, and confirmed the, um, that this, these were weeds and the garden people told me, that they were about to replant something because something died. And so I basically negotiated with the garden, which happened to be then the city of Lisbon, because it's a public city garden, um, to not touch this for a whole year. And it seems a very simple idea, and <laughs> yet it was very complicated. Um, and basically, the work happens to be the contract, uh, which is here in English, and I have also a version in Portuguese, uh, which is now signed by the deputy mayor of Lisbon for uh, environment and ecology. And uh, um, so basically, I'm, I'm asking them in this contract to not do anything, um, except that I allow myself to come with my compost in, as a kickstarter of the project. I fertilize this. Uh, this island is like a two square meter island. Huh? We were talking about the, the small island on the pond in the greenhouse. It's very small, it's very symbolic, and yet it's a preserved place. It's a sort of, of nature reserve in a sense, but in a sense of a garden, it's a very cultivated place. It's also a very colonial place in a sense, you know, because it's showing all those tropical plants in Lisbon, which is a city where colonial, colonialism is heavy, um, the heritage is heavy, um, and, and basically I'm, I'm proposing to make a micro nature reserve uh, and, and see what life gives when we don't do anything. Um, so it's been running now, it's running at the moment, it's been six months. I don't have the photos here, only from a few months um, after it started. Uh, when I started the project, there was only one plant, um, Samolus valerandi, which is a sea cabbage, a water cabbage. Um, then came the, a few months later, I came back to Lisbon and observed that nettle, stinging nettle was taking over. And, and now I'm just observing what happens there. Uh, there is, uh, you know, the, the bio war is happening. It's so fascinating. So another plant took over. The whole island um, eventually was eaten by some uh, uh, water uh, chicken, uh, swamp chicken, uh, who actually uh, bred there and made three uh, baby chicks. They are having their, their, their um, bird nest on the island now. Um, and now I came back, everything was dead and some tree is growing. Um, so the garden people are very happy about the experiment because they are observing a lot of things, what are happening. Um, it doesn't look always very lush. 
Um, so one can see this uh, sign which I designed a bit in the Volimax um, um, style of um, a map, map, uh, map gardening, a garden map, sorry. The QR code you can scan and it opens to the contract. Um, so this, this is ongoing and it's just about doing nothing, which is also very good in permaculture sometimes that you let nat nature regulate itself. Um, and I would um, continue this. I just I don't know how much I should talk, but um, Marlies, you tell me, huh? because I can talk forever. <laughs> Um, okay, so I would like maybe to to jump to another uh, trans uh, species project that I I done a few years ago and that really matters to me. It's called Palazzo delle Api, uh, the Palace of the Bees. Um, it's a, it's a public artwork in um, a biodynamic farm in Gavi in Italy. It's between uh, Milan and Genova. Um, so it, w it was a commission for permanent work. Um, of course, I had to take care of the, um, of the environment and the, the context of a biodynamic farm, which was for me a, the best playground uh, you can imagine. And after studying what happens there, um, I saw that they, 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 are, they have bees, you know, but they have honeybees that, honeybees are a bit the, the pets of the insect or the dolphins of the insect. Humans are very in love with honeybees because they are so lovely, they make honey. And we love honey. I have nothing against honeybees, now I'm being a bit cynical, but um, they are great and they are pollinating, they are fascinating, but um, they are not the most important pollinators and we mostly <laughs> care for them because we exploit them. <laughs> um, and there are tons of other pollinators that are out there that are doing a, a, a great job and effort in uh, pollinating um, 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 trees and, and flowers. Um, like mason bees and bumblebees and, and, and lots of others, carpenter bees. Some of them don't look like bees at all. They are looking like black flies and they are not so sexy, I would say. Um, yet they are very much endangered and we are threatening their inhabitat. Um, so I, I guess as, as of today, everyone has seen what, uh, what is a bee hotel. I don't really like this word, that's the one that is mostly used in the Baumarkt and, and so on. Uh, they are usually made of wood or bamboo with little sticks and then a little roof like this and people put them in their Kleingarten or their terrace or their garden. It's very cute, it's very great. I'm totally for this, that is becoming um, a widespread uh, culture and, and that people care for, for bees. It gives them a home and it's fantastic. So basically that was my, 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 start, my, my point of departure for these projects is to, to make a sculpture which would also be a monument, which would also be an architecture, um, to host as many pollinating insects as possible, but to make it, to make it um, perennial, it had to not to be in wood. And so I made it with the local stone. The, it so I went for the next mountain and found what is the stone they use there. It happens to be the Lucerna stone, which is a, also a non-spectacular gray stone and not uh, a luxurious white marble, um, but it's available uh, and it's just next door. And uh, and then my research uh, taught, uh, brought me to to understand if it would work uh, with this material because beekeepers. I mean, it was basically knowledge that nobody had. So this is when it comes to my work has sometimes this uh, crossing borders with speculative design, architecture. Um, art and um, other sciences like biology and um, so I met I, I met a lot of people for advising me on this project and then I, I gained some knowledge but I didn't have all my answers and only only experimenting could 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 uh, tell if it works um, so I'm m maybe breaking the suspense it worked <laughs> and um, the um, insect colonized it after one season um, so they settled in the holes and I drilled uh, over 2,000 holes with different diameters to accommodate some different pollinating insects that have different needs in, in uh, um, habitation size, a bit like us, if we're bigger or, or not, we need a bigger bed or a bigger apartment. Um, so the design then, of course, is, is unusual. You can see it's a very minimal inverted pyramid. Um, that has a very strong science fiction uh, connotation. 
as well as it comes from metabolism, which is this uh, architecture, uh, Japanese architecture movement from the 80s, uh, like the Nakagin Capsule Hotel that everyone probably have seen once, uh, at least on photos. Um, metabolism was interesting because it's, it's a very niche and very short movement that took from um, animal habitat, or more, more specifically for, from insect architecture, to, to put it for humans. It didn't really work, uh, or it didn't really last and, 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 and work. Uh, so in this case, I took from, from this and gave it back to the insects. Um, one of the, the features that needed to be accomplished is the, the, the bees need to be dry, and therefore they need a roof, and to avoid the, the, the roof, uh, let's say the, the, the typical house roof. Uh, I found that this inverted pyramid was a, a good system to give them a roof. Inverted pyramid in human scale architecture is very complicated. There's a few examples. Uh, I think the, the library in Bratislava is one. Uh, the, the, is it the National Library or the, uh, there is one big building in Bratislava that is an inverted pyramid. It, it's, a, it's very challenging in terms of statics. Uh, but in, this is one meter 60 by one meter 60. It is doable in the scale of insect architecture, so I took the opportunity and um, thought in the worst case it's a mon nice monument to the pollinating insects. In the best case, it's working as an architecture for animal. Um, and so far, it's, it's totally being um, habitated. Um, I would maybe give a, a last, um, a last um, hint into one work that is uh, maybe a little bit more poetic. I mean, not that the, my other works maybe are totally not poetic, but um, this, this one is, um, has, has, let's say, an abstraction level. Um, it's a work from 2016 that is titled Planet Nursery. Um, that is a sort of fountain um, made of uh, bamboo and plexiglass and stone. Um, the tubes are engraved with some, some drawings and um, it's all, all the idea comes from those very specific stones. Um, they are, they are um, sphere shapes stones. They are natural, they look like concrete, they are not, they are uh, called concretions or trovans. Trovans is the, the Romanian name. I, I went to, uh, how do you say, uh, gather them, uh, um, scoop them in, in Romania, in one of the few places that you can find them in the river and in the valley. Um, they are basically uh, the equivalent of stalactites without the cave. So it's, it's a sandstone that um, um, binds together um, with calc. Um, and they basically are little spheres that grow with time, and eventually, eventually they become they become really big. Um, and I could show you one just short, if my computer allows it. Um, so basically, I took the assumption that the poetic assumption that eventually they can grow infinitely, and they can become planets. So I just kept giving them what they need, which is water uh, and sand. And it's a, basically a nurturing, it's a nursing uh, home for those uh, stones to grow. Um, and where is this file? It's just to show you this, yeah. So they can grow this big. Uh, I mean, I've seen some that big. This one has a crack in it. Um, and yeah, so, so the Planet Nursery, um, yeah, is, uh, is basically a specu speculative um, planet, uh, planet house for futures where we won't have one anymore. I hope this doesn't happen. So we take care of our own planet. Since I know the first thing I saw were the postcards of every, of every postcard of the sunsets in Hawaii. 
back then, also the Saving Stones work. I think it's like way back, you know, 12, 13, yeah. something like that. And I really love how you find your way as an artist and gardener through this um, journey of the past years. And uh, thank you for also being part of the Vienna Biennale. Thank and you. Also, yes, I have to just pay a colleague from Berlin who uh, is also part of our show. And I would say that you want some weeks. Exactly. Since we are open for all the informal talking while watering some tiny plants. Yeah, I'm happy to answer your questions, and um, we can now go out on the street and <clears throat> water a few weeds around the museum. <laughs> Thank you. Just one yeah. question. You never had any problem with any authorities in With what? what? Authorities. In my whole life? <laughs> in your I, I, well, <laughs> I, I had a few arguments with authorities, but usually the, the narrative uh, can, can seduce even um, um, police or, you know, they, they, they can understand. It, it's, it's somehow a bit hard to project in, a, in an artist uh, fantasy immediately when you, you're breaching laws or kind of step on, on, on laws, but um, I always got away with it. Thank you. Danke.